Today, we're going to spend some time talking about this chip right here. It's an MOS 6530-009. They're referred to as R-Riot chips. R-Riot stood for RAM, ROM, Input, Output, Timer. These things were made by MOS Technology way back in 1975. That's before Commodore bought the company even, because remember that happened in 1976. So we're going to have a little tiny history lesson about them, give you some little bit of information about what they were used in, and then we're going to close out with some fun technical stuff. Mainly, how would you go about dumping the ROM part of this R Riot chip? So sit back, relax, and let's have some fun. This was a fairly early chip from MOS. The company was founded in 1969, and the 6530 was created in 1975. The first production use I'm aware of was on the Kim One single board computer, which used two 6530 chips, the 6530-002 and the 6530-003. The 6530 was also well known for being used in the Commodore Chessmate, the electronic chess game released in 1977 after Commodore's 1976 purchase of MOS Technology Inc. Finally, although often using Commodore part numbers in lieu of the more familiar MOS 6530 nomenclature, 6530 variants were used in several of Commodore's disk drives including the 8050, 4040, and SFD 1001 shown here. There were at least 30 variants of the 6530 that we know of. The star of this video happens to be a 6530-009. Remember that MOS started out primarily as a company that designed and sold chips, not consumer electronic devices or computers. The 6530-009 was created for and sold to Allied Leisure Inc., a company from Florida in the United States, for use in one of their full-size arcade pinball machines. With that short history lesson out of the way, now we're going to get to the fun part. The technical details about how I dumped the ROM image from this. Now I know what you're thinking. Dumping a ROM image, you just buy a TL-866 off eBay for $11.98, you press a button, you've got your ROM image. That's the case with most EPROMs and mask ROMs, but the 6530 is a little bit more complicated. So let's talk about that now. Here's the data sheet for the 6530. I highlighted everything that will show up in the address space of the chip when you read it. You can see that you have to navigate more than just a ROM, so our first challenge is going to be separating the ROM image from the rest of the stuff on the chip. Another challenge is that the 6530 has address decoding logic built in. This is what allows the ROM on the two 6530s on the Kim one to coexist at separate addresses within the Kim one's address space with no need for external address decoding on the Kim one board. So not only do we have to separate the ROM from the other stuff that shows up in the 6530 address space, we now know that the ROM may not even live at a consistent location across different 6530s. This page of the datasheet shows how the address lines can be used. I've highlighted the part about mask programming. All of these address lines could be mask programmed by MOS to behave however a customer wanted. So this doesn't explain how to use the address lines on a 6530. It shows some examples of how it can possibly be configured. So one more challenge for us to add to our list is that the address lines, including ROM select and chip select lines, could be configured differently across different 6530s. Finally, the pinout of a 6530. Let's talk about the pins that we'll need to connect if we want to be able to read the ROM image from a 6530. I'll be connecting power and ground. The 6530 needs a reset signal, so I'll connect that. Pin three is a clock input signal. We need that. Since we want to read data from it, we obviously need to connect all eight data lines. The read write line will need to be connected. All 10 address lines will be used. Now, 10 address lines gives us a total of 1,024 possible addresses. We know we need to read a 1024 byte ROM plus other stuff. Clearly, 10 address lines aren't going to cut it, now will they? That's why we'll also need to connect the ROM select pin RS0 and the two chip select pins CS1 and CS2. Those will be used as additional address lines. We talked about all the technical challenges that face us, and really, it's not that bad, right? I mean, I wanted you to know that this isn't just an EEPROM that we press the easy button and we have our data, 
but we're not splitting atoms here. At the end of the day, we really are just wiring up a chip and reading from it. So, now that we understand that, what options do we have available to us? How do we go about wiring it up? What do we wire it to? And how do we read it? Let's talk about that next. There are commercial solutions to this. One fella I talked to uses a Fluke 9010A and a 6502 pod to read 6530s, and he said it's a complete cakewalk. I don't have such a device, so the solution I landed on first was to build a small circuit board including a clock and wire it up to an Arduino, then write code to dump the ROM. That worked, but I didn't find great enjoyment in that solution. Even though I had already accomplished what I set out to do, I really wanted to find a way to use a Kim 1 to dump the 6530 ROMs. It just seemed like the simplest, most elegant solution there could be. The 6530 was literally designed to be used in a system like a Kim 1. I ended up landing on a Corsham Kim 1 clone as my solution, but let me explain. To me, the Corsham Kim 1 clone is what I would have bought back in the 70s if I had a zillion dollars. It is the most tricked out Kim 1 you can possibly have, and everything is configurable. Also, it's still built with a real 6502 and 6532s. It has the original feel of the Kim 1 when you use it, but all the modern conveniences. The modern conveniences are why I chose to use it for this project. Modern convenience number one, the prototyping board. Everything is set up for you to just attach to the application and expansion connectors of the Kim 1 clone and start building. It's a huge time saver. Convenience number two, the ability to save directly to an SD card. This is what I'll use to save the 6530 ROM image. Now that my lengthy preamble's out of the way, we can get started having fun in this video. So to be clear, what we're doing is we're wiring that 6530-009 to a prototype board connected to the application and expansion connectors of the Kim 1 clone. It literally is making it part of that system. That's why this is such an elegant solution. Uh, you, we're using the regular address lines from the Kim 1 clone, the data lines from the Kim 1 clone. It will live on the data bus of the Kim 1 clone. It's using reset from the Kim 1 clone. It is part of that computer system once we're done here. All we have to do is wire it up. Let's go get started. First, I'm going to place the 6530 on the board. Then give it power. The Kim 1 clone puts out 8 volts on its expansion connector. The 6530 needs 5 volts, so I'll put a 5 volt regulator on the board. Now reset, and there's no magic, it just connects right to the reset line of the Kim 1. Now we connect clock, and again, just provided for us by the Kim 1. All eight data lines connect on the application connector of the Kim 1. This is a direct connection to the Kim 1's data bus. The CPU will have direct access to the 6530-009. All 10 primary address lines will be connected. This is a good time to test. If I've got anything wired incorrectly, it can make the Kim 1 not boot, or at very least, not work properly. Looking good. I mentioned earlier that I'd be wiring up the ROM select and chip select lines as additional address lines on the Kim 1.
The jumpers at JP5 need to be modified. If a jumper is installed here, the Kim clone will map its onboard RAM into the address range as shown. I want the 6530 to have full run of the address space, so I'm going to remove all of them except C000 through FFFF. Because I have JP1 set to map the EEPROM in at E000, I'll leave that jumper in place because I'll be using the Corsham extended monitor on that EEPROM. I noticed it seems to want to have RAM at C000 even though that's not documented, so I left that jumper in place also. There could be something else going on there, but I didn't spend the time to find out. Time to connect USB and then make some magic. Before I start randomly bashing on my keyboard, let me explain what I'm trying to do here. I'll start with the memory map of the Kim 1. This is a normal Kim 1. The part we're concerned with is at the very, very top there from 2000 to FFFF, where it says available for expansion. Well, we don't have a stock Kim 1. We have the Corsham clone. And I mentioned before I'm leaving C000 through FFFF alone. E000 through FFFF is for the Corsham Extended Monitor, and for reasons not clear to me, it wouldn't work when C000 wasn't available to it. So, what we're looking at is that we have nothing mapped in from 2000 to BFFF. That's going to be where we should find the 6530-009. Now, the entirety of addressable locations inside of 6530 is just over 1K, right? It's 1K for the ROM, 64 bytes of RAM, then however many bytes for registers, timer, and I.O. locations. We'll call it 1.2K. Uh, that's a tiny percentage of the 41K of open address space we have. If we stacked 6530s into that address space, we could fit almost 40 copies. Well, that's what we should expect to see. We won't know exactly at which addresses we'll find it, but as we start at 2000 and work our way up through memory, we should see the entire contents of the 6530-009 repeat themselves. The way I'll attempt to find the 6530 ROM so I can dump it will be a simple, low-tech, brute force approach of just looking at the dumped memory locations from it. 1K of contiguous ROM should stand out fairly obviously, given that everything else on the chip is so small. Here I am running Minicom now. I have the Kim1 clone connected via serial over USB. Uh, before I do anything else, I'm going to change the baud rate. I have it set to 2400, which is what the Corsham docs recommend. Uh, it's working, but I'm going to change that to 9600 in the interest of speed. It should generally work. If we see any corrupted data coming across the wire, we'll know why. Okay, here we are in the Kim clone. I'm going to press X to launch the extended monitor, and then a question mark will show us the commands we can run. That H should jump out to you. That's what we want to do is look at all the memory from 2000 to BFFF, and H, hex dump memory, is the perfect tool for doing that. I'm going to speed this up for you because there's no way you want to sit through this. Our terminal buffer now has every memory location from 2000 through BFFF dumped to it. My expectation is that there are several copies of the 6530-009's entire address space here for us to scroll back through. And remember, what we're looking for here is a contiguous block of 1K that looks like ROM code. Now, what does ROM code look like? Well, I mean, it should be obvious. It's not going to be things like just blocks of FF bytes, for example. This is starting to look promising here. We see 6502 opcodes here. It is a big contiguous block. Let's scroll up and see where it starts. Indeed, here we go. Look at AC00. You can see how that is an LDA opcode starting it out and right above there is rubbish still. That is clearly not ROM code. Uh, with 1K being 4000 hex, this should end at AFFF and it does. 
we've found our first copy of the ROM code, AC00 to AFFF. Now, as I said, the 6530's address space should repeat itself, so I'm just going to keep scrolling for fun here and see if I find another copy. And it looks like I already did. It's right here. And... Ah, there it is, starting at A400 there. So yeah, we found another copy. It's at AC00, and then again at A400, which will end at A7FF. And it does. So yeah, we found two copies of it already. Uh, mission accomplished. That was nice and easy. So what do we do now? Let's scroll back down, and I'll show you how to save it. Question mark as a reminder to show available commands, and there it is, S, save memory to file, and we want to save AC00 through AFFF. Now, it is going to save it in Intel hex dump format. Uh, to get it into a binary, we'll have to convert it, but we can do that. I'm probably not going to show you that in this video. So that's it. That's everything. We saved the ROM from a 6530. And I lied. Quick screenshot from my Linux machine. If you have binutils installed, here is how you convert the Intel hex dump format to a binary. Enjoy. So that's it. Another video done. I don't imagine there's going to be a lot of interest in this one because it really is a bit of a niche topic, but I had a blast learning about this and working through all the issues with making it happen. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed watching it, maybe even learned something. I'll see you next time. Thank you.